implement uh, community health initiatives and I evaluate some of our active living work, particularly focused on biking and walking. Um, I know some of the panelists from my time in Columbus, Ohio, where I was working at Nationwide Children's Hospital and their Center for Injury Research and Policy on Transportation, where I was focused on um, bicycle and pedestrian safety. And uh, I've been a cyclist for about half my life now, so I've been a bike commuter for the last um, uh, 15 years, we'll say. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Catherine Jervis, would you like to go next? Oh, you are on mute, by the way. Thank you. My name is Catherine Gervis. I've been a everyday bike commuter for about um, 12 years now. Um, you know, new to recreational cycling in the last few years. I'm the former executive director of Yay Bikes, a nonprofit advocacy organization in um, Columbus, Ohio. And I now work as a consultant uh, planner with Tool Design, which is a consulting firm that um, focuses on creating uh, communities that are friendly for people to travel in, um, in ways that don't require owning a car. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, next, I'll have Mr. Steve Magus introduce himself. Hey, there we go. Steve Magus, I'm an attorney. Uh, I have been an attorney since 1982. I've been riding a bike since about 1962, I guess. So a long time. Uh, and I've always been a kind of a casual to fitness a rider, uh, never a racer, uh, although I've represented some racers. I've done 450 bike crash cases out of the thousands of uh, personal injury and wrongful death cases that I've done. I also, uh, I sit on the board of the Ohio Bicycle Federation. I help write the legal stuff uh, relative to Ohio law and uh, assist with local groups on those types of issues. And I've had a research project ad hoc, so to speak, uh, for many years, what I, which I call the Fatal Crash Project, in which we look in depth at every fatal bicycle crash in Ohio. And uh, let's see if I do this right. There we go. We just started the, uh, the BCRC, the Bicycle Crash research center that's a new nonprofit that uh, we haven't quite got the corporate stuff for but we're got a logo so that's a start and that will take over this ad hoc fatal crash research and we're, where we dig into every crash uh, in great detail awesome thank you all right dr joseph morrow please introduce yourself yeah, hi, thank you so much for having me. My name's Joe Morrow. Uh, I'm an ER doctor at Miami Valley Hospital here in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, it's the uh, only level one trauma center in Dayton, so we get a lot of accidents, including some bike accidents. Uh, I'm originally from Dayton. Uh, I've been at Miami Valley for the last 10 years, uh, working in the ER there. Uh, I've been the medical director of the emergency department for the last two years. I uh, don't have much of a, of a background in biking. I uh, kind of guess I'm on more for, for, for medical input, uh, but, but I do enjoy biking. I did get a bike a couple of years ago uh, for, for Christmas, and I, I do like to ride it around my neighborhood with my kids and with my wife and uh, starting to do it for exercise. And I also have had the opportunity uh, to, to uh, go around the city on a bike tour of Toronto, uh, which I really enjoyed. So uh, maybe, maybe this webinar will motivate me to become more, more of a biker, but uh, I appreciate you guys having me. Yeah, thank you so much. I certainly hope so. <laughs> uh, so again, thanks to all of our panelists. I did forget to interject that we are going to re we are recording this um, webinar, so we will send out the video link to this at the end of um, as of as a follow up. That we'll also be sending out some resources uh, that you might find helpful at the close of this. Uh, so do look out for that and please share it with other folks in your life who you would love to have this information. So we do have a set of prepared questions. You know, the title of this um, panel was what to do after a crash, but I do believe we will touch on sort of the before and during as well, because um, certainly all of that is important for helping to deal with the unexpected. So just to kick us off, our first question, and I'm gonna open it up to all panelists. Um, when we think about crashes, a lot of us jump to the worst, uh, you know, involving another vehicle, involving a fatality, but we know that the most common type of crash is often 
solo. Uh, it is more common that you will lose control of your bike either because of the built environment, uh, because of lack of attention, a multitude of reasons. Um, so what are some things, you know, should we be involved in a solo crash that uh, you might advise someone to do ahead of time to help prepare for that kind of situation? Well, I, I guess, would you I like mean, to start? Sure. I, I, I uh, wrote an article, uh, gosh, 15, 20 years ago for Adventure Cycling called the BLS, the Boring Legal Stuff that uh, you should think about before you ride your bike. Uh, so from the legal end, that would include doing things like making sure your insurance is up to date, uh, car insurance, health insurance, homeowners insurance, uh, making sure that your estate planning is up to date because if something happens to you, you wanna make sure all of that stuff is taken care of. Uh, from a crash perspective though, I mean, it's, and Catherine, you could probably talk as much to anyone because you're, you ride every day somewhere. Uh, on the road, you have to make sure your bike is in good shape, that you're in good shape, that you're paying attention to what you're doing so that dumb things don't happen. Your your pants don't get caught in the chain. You're, you're, you don't hit a bump because you're trying to read your text as you're riding along. I mean, there's a, a myriad of ways that you can crash in a solo fashion, but uh, uh, you know, paying attention to your surroundings and knowing what you're you're doing once you get on the bike are the main things. Yeah, thank you for that. So I guess I'll add to that. Um, you know, as somebody who's ridden for a very long time, um, almost every day, uh, that the crash you are most likely to have is with yourself. Um, I, I, you know, as my skinned knees, my scarred knees will show you, I'm not eight years old anymore, even though I feel like it in my head sometimes. And there are things that I try that, um, just don't turn out well. Um, having said that, um, I, I think the thing we as a community of people who ride and we as a community of people who love people who ride um, need to think about as it relates to, um, you know, before a crash um, or before someone we love is in a crash is to think about how we're going to respond to folks. Um, one of the, I think one of the things that is often said that is meant to be helpful has to do with um, be safe um, and, and things along those lines. Um, the truth is that, um, you know, mostly we're incredibly safe as riders, um, particularly when we're out there riding with traffic. Like we know the, um, we know what um, the outcome is going to be if we come, if, you know, me and my bike, if the 200 pounds of us come up against 2,000 pounds of metal. Um, and I, I think there are, I think the idea of, um, I, I worry about the unintentional victim blaming that comes along with um, the words that are often meant to be supportive that are that actually end up communicating um, that we have a, a control that we don't have um, when those kind of crashes happen. Um, so I think thinking about how we want to interface with people that we care about and and thinking about what the expectations we have of um, the people who um, decide how the biggest public asset that we as a community own our public right-of-way the streets uh, sidewalks and paths are used and how they're divided up um, in a way that um, is not only equitable, but safe for everyone who's traveling from one place to another, regardless of what mode they're traveling. Yeah, I think definitely I find myself doing that as, as speaking to the culture around biking. You know, I wouldn't say be safe to somebody necessarily getting in their car and going home. So making sure that, you know, Cycling is a safe activity and we can have confidence uh, in those that are out there doing it. 
I think that's a good point. Anybody else want to jump in on this? I think I would just jump in with the public health message of consider wearing a helmet. Absolutely. So speaking of helmets, that is something that we all recommend folks should do, uh, but that can also sometimes be built into that culture of victim blaming. It's often sometimes the only thing reported about uh, the cyclist condition, whether or not they were wearing a helmet. Um, it's also, you know, something that we can, can become part of that victim blaming. But as we, as we know, if you are unfortunate enough to get hit by a car, unfortunately, whether or not you had a helmet on may or may not make a difference. Um, so, when it comes to kind of flipping the script on some of these conversations or these, this victim blaming, blaming that is so prevalent uh, with some of these examples, what have you run into either in your personal life or in your work that kind of helps combat that? I think one of the sweetest moments I ever experienced in my work life was in a uh, a meeting, a statewide meeting of folks who were talking about what needed to be done to increase safety. Um, and there were conversations about helmets and neon colored shirts and other things that um, while uh, I, I think we sometimes confuse um, mitigation with prevention. Um, and as much as I want um, to make sure that um, if a crash happens, somebody is protected, my child is protected, I don't want us to get confused about um, what someone's wardrobe has to do with crash prevention. Um, in, in the same way, we were once confused as a culture about what a woman's wardrobe might have to do with rape. I think we are very much in the, in the place right now in our culture about what a cyclist wardrobe has to do with crashes. Um, and so I think we need to be really careful about not being confused about um, what the public discourse should be around after a crash. Um, I don't care what someone was wearing. I care about how that street was designed. I care about um, what the intervention is going to be that follows up after that. Um, and, and as I started to say, um, one of the sweetest moments I ever had was in, in this, you know, conversation with statewide leaders across the group, you know, having these conversations about helmets and t-shirts and someone in the group said, um, well, most crashes happen after dark. Maybe what we should really be talking about is cars shouldn't be allowed to drive after dark. Um, and that's as sensible a solution as requiring that cyclists wear neon colored wardrobes. Like, um, let, let's talk about real solutions. This idea of safe crashing versus safe driving, I think, is interesting because I've always argued that the government should not be in the business of telling me what hat I want to, I have to wear in order to do something, whether it's play baseball or go to a Reds game or walk down the street or ride a bicycle. So um, the, taking the government out of the, the safe crashing angle uh, for the cyclist, I think would be a, a, a good start. And then there's a constant battle uh, that advocates face in every report basically that we, we tend to scour these media reports for how are they, is this a crash or an accident? So we start getting into language uh, with the media and language with public officials and uh, how they assess blame instantly one way or the other when perhaps, you know, that's uh, not the best approach on these things. So there's a lot of language and a lot of uh, blame shifting, blame pointing, finger pointing that as advocates, you know, we can try to slow that down and take a more measured approach and, and encourage a better use of, of language to describe what's happening on the roads.
You know, one thing that I would add from my own experience is that it's not just in the discussion of, um, of bike policy that this comes up. And so even I'm talking to people about other policies um, where people complain or, or are expressing their concern about subsidies going toward a specific segment of the population. You know, I, I point out, especially when I, when I, I, I rarely drive now, but there were, I spent most of my adult life without a car. And I would bring up that as a cyclist, I'm paying for a lot of the road that I don't necessarily get to use. And so if we want to talk about some of these risks, let's talk about, let's talk about people getting behind the car and how I'm paying for that um, as a citizen. And so I think, you know, we can also insert it into other conversations as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and I think that that is what we're trying to do when advocating for complete streets and the built environment and trying to make it safer for all modes. I think that's a really good point. Well, being aware of the points and being able to counter the sort of arguments you get from people is helpful for you know, anytime there's an article about cycling, you start into the comment section and it says, Cyclists don't pay taxes. They don't pay road taxes. You know, they, uh, they don't have insurance and blah, blah, blah. And so, you, and so it's like, if you know the background of those and can discuss those intelligently, well, there is no such thing as a road tax. And yes, we do pay taxes and our taxes all go into this general fund and we do help fund these roads. And, and you know, to me, I always come back with, you know, what we ought to do is not worry about who's paying to build the roads, but who's paying to repair the roads and why. So there was a great study that said a semi causes something, I, I forget the numbers, but it was something like 40,000 times the damage that a car does, you know, or some, some huge multiplier. The semi causes damage to the road in a huge multiplier of a car. And the car, if the car is 1.0, the semi is like 40,000 and the bicycle is like 0.003 or something. So we should be getting refunds on our taxes for riding and bikes and semis ought to be paying into a, a fund to uh, help repair all the, the cracks and damages that they cause on the road. And so if we had that change the dynamic of how we discuss roads and, and, and repairs and all that, that may be another angle to use in your discussions with folks. Well, and beyond that, the whole idea that um, Roads are communally owned property, right? Roads, parks, sidewalks. This is our communally owned real estate. Um, it is not that, it is not for, car, for cars, right. it is for traveling. And so understanding the difference between those two things, I, I think it's in particular, I, I was at a conference and saw somebody in a t-shirt that said um, on-street parking is theft. And that had never occurred to me before, but you know, we actually subsidize private car storage in the form of on-street parking and prioritize that over separated bike facilities, you know, creating safe spaces for people to travel. Um, but we've so normalized that, that that's, that's something people should expect. And so I think anything we can do to just challenge the norms about how we're using this public asset that we all collectively own um, is an important part of how we have conversations about, prevent, about how we decide as a community we're gonna prevent crashes. Absolutely. Um, so not to harp on you too much, <laughs> Ms. Jervis, but I was hoping you could, uh, your uh, crash experience was actually one of the inspiration uh, for putting this panel together. Uh, so I was hoping you could speak specifically about your experience trying to report your crash? I, I think um, there are all sorts of broken systems when we think about um, why crashes happen and what happens after a crash. 
Um, and, and we've talked about some of the reasons why crashes happen that relate to street design and um, you know our expectations about how we use that right of way. But I I was most shocked about I I was in a um, I was hit by a car two years ago, um, and the thing that surprised me most was what happened after the crash. Um, first, I did not anticipate looking back the role that adrenaline would play in making me feel like I was fine, I was good, I'm on my way to a meeting, I really need to get to that meeting. And to be honest, the only reason I made the 911 call was because I'm a bike advocate and I wanted an, a dot on the map. I wanted some, because I know how decisions are made about how roads are designed and, and that's what influenced me more than anything else to call police to report the crash. Um, it, was a, it was a rainy day, which means there are more crashes than usual and in the city that I live in, um, Police don't respond to every crash on rainy days. They respond to injuries, um, crashes with injuries. Um, so when they asked me if I was injured in my adrenaline pumped state, my response was, I'm not sure. I, there's a lot of adrenaline happening. I can't really tell. I think I'm okay. Um, I actually got a recording of the 911 call because I wanted to to see later after the fact what I'd actually said. Um, and at that point, the, the 911 operator told me, okay, well, basically best of luck. <laughs> you know, Sounds like you're good, move on with your day. Um, you know, go trade insurance information with the driver. Um, and as we were in the midst of trading insurance information, and I could tell that I wasn't thinking clearly that my, you know, everything that happens when you're pumped with adrenaline was going on in my mind. Um, I was smart enough to call someone who wasn't pumped with adrenaline who could help me think through things and reminded me that it made sense to call back and, and and have a medical professional check me out. Um, when I did call back, I had to argue with the 911 operator to have someone come look at me. Um, and when a squad and a police officer showed up at the scene, um, the they didn't quite roll their eyes, but they kind of rolled their eyes about the whole thing. Now I should say the circumstances of my crash were, um, I was traveling in a bike lane on a street that was marked at um, 30 miles an hour. Um, traffic was moving faster than that. Um, and it was, the driver turned in front of me. Um, I didn't have enough time to stop. Um, and somehow, my bike ended up about three quarters of the way under the car with me turned around facing the other direction. Um, so it made sense that I got medical attention, but, but I had to fight pretty hard to get that. And I had to, um, and I had to fight pretty hard with the paramedics um, to, to help me figure out it felt like people were telling me to walk it off. Um, and I don't think the police officers or the paramedics were bad people. I do think they were not trained properly and we don't have good protocols in the state of Ohio about what should happen when metal hits flesh. Um, you know, just that action to me, um, we need somebody who hasn't just um, been hit by a car to be the decision maker and to and to make sure somebody's checked out. Um, and we don't have good protocols like that yet. Um, and in fact, in a bike crash, it's very common for your head to get rattled around, even if 
you don't hit the pavement, the, the, the impact and the whip thing and all of that of your brain can lead to a, a head injury. Um, I, had, I had a case where the guy had a, a camera on his helmet. He got rear-ended, he went down. His, he could hear the head hit and then he popped up. He looked behind him, his bike is under the car. He looked around, he got up, he went over and sat down happened to be across the street from a Chipotle, which was across from the medical center. All the docs came racing out and they're talking to him. And you see him in the video, he's answering questions and saying, I'm okay, let me go, I gotta get going. He had no memory, still to this day. A 30, 30 minute video, he has no memory. He's walking, talking, telling people he's okay. And he's suffering a head injury, had a concussion and has no memory of any of that. So. Um, one thing to do of my 10 or 12 things to do on the on the crash uh, what if you crash list is just stop you know let the medical people do their thing get them there don't uh, the cyclists have a tendency to almost be embarrassed when they're in a crash when they're hit by somebody else and it's like oh i got hit I, you know i i'm fine let me get out of here you know they're kind of embarrassed that the, the emts are coming or they don't have insurance so they don't want to pay and they're looking at a, all of a sudden a thousand or five thousand dollar bill they didn't expect i mean all these things kind of are flipping through a brain that's already been rattled a bit and so now you're trying to make judgments on how you feel and what your injuries might be and what's the best thing for you to do legally medically and you're in no spot to do that when you're sitting on the ground at a you know after a crash soaking wet in the rain i mean yeah absolutely Dr. Morrow, could you speak to uh, the importance of getting checked out? I kind of have a couple questions for you. Um, what resources might be available to someone who is worried about a big medical bill? Um, and also too, you know, sometimes we're riding with other people who experience this kind of crash. And um, we're getting some background noise I'm hearing. Everyone make sure you're muted, thank you. Um, but also, making sure that we know how to recognize these things sometimes um, with a friend or family who may have been involved in a crash uh, and encourage them to get help, so. Sure, uh, yeah, I'll try to go through kind of e each point uh, quickly here. So uh, obviously, uh, you know, like Catherine had said, uh, initially your adrenaline may be pumping. Uh, you may not recognize fairly significant injuries uh, as you're, you know, you have that flight or, uh, fight or flight response, uh, sympathetic nervous system that, that goes into attack. And essentially uh, your body just tells your body you're okay to go, to go, to go. Uh, sometimes you're not really recognizing some of these things until later on when you've had a chance to kind of calm down, uh, to kind of relax a little bit. And then some of these, you know, more serious or even less serious, but nagging medical issues, you know, start to take effect. But uh, certainly, um, you know, don't delay with certain things as, as lacerations. Uh, laceration repairs need to be done uh, within a, a certain amount of time uh, for not only cosmetic uh, appearance, but also to, to lower the risk of infection. So you really, with most lacerations, uh, have about uh, half a day to three quarters of a day uh, to get it repaired. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be at high risk for, of infection, and it's going to be somewhat difficult to repair without maybe necessarily seeing a plastic surgeon. So um, a lot of people will wait several days uh, with a laceration, to, and then at that point, uh, just very difficult to repair. So lacerations are very time sensitive. Um, also uh, dislocations, any, any kind of uh, fracture. Um, if you look at your arm, you look at your wrist, you look at your elbow, you look at your ankle and it doesn't look right. <laughs> those are certainly things, you know, you need to be seen sooner rather than later because acute fractures, acute dislocations, they can cause long-term vascular injury, long-term nerve injuries as well. And, and those are things that you really don't want to, you know, sleep on or, or wait to the next day to be seen. Uh, we'll talk uh, just a little bit about head injuries. Uh, obviously, what we see is a lot of head injuries with bike crashes. And, uh, you know, I'll just repeat, you know, what Dylan said, it's so important to wear a helmet. I'm so amazed how many people come in with a head injury and they have their helmet and their helmet's cracked. I mean, I've seen that multiple times uh, that their helmet's cracked, that they, that they bring in with them with the EMS. Um, and, you know, they're pretty much okay other than some concussive symptoms. Uh, but, you know, I'd certainly much rather have that than a skull fracture or an intracranial hemorrhage 
which you're definitely going to get uh, if you're not wearing a helmet. So, um, you know, that force that it costs to crack the helmet would essentially be going on your skull, uh, which you're going to have a lot more acutely devastating issues kind of related to that. Um, the second thing you kind of asked is uh, about medical bills. Um, I actually, it's kind of a little bit outside my scope, you know, as an ER physician, but I did reach out to our, our billing department and uh, she sent me uh, some links with both uh, premier cost as well as Kettering cost uh, for basically all the, you know, things that people come to the hospital for. So a chest x-ray, baseline labs and electrolytes, CAT scans, things like that, that, that basically your cost would be that the, the hospital's cost is. So I can share that with you, Laura, if you wanna share that at the end, uh, so people can kind of take a look at it. Uh, but kind of, you know, what they looked at from that scenario is, you know, they're required to, you know, share this, you know, publicly on a website. Um, it's, it's a cost for somebody essentially without insurance. So basically, if say there's a cost for a CAT scan, it's $3,000. Maybe within your insurance plan that you have, you have a different contracted rate. So say the contracted rate is like $1,900. And then your plan may say that you owe 20% of a copay of the $1,900, which would be $380. So you got a $3,000 CAT scan that you see maybe on the website ends up being maybe a couple hundred dollars out of pocket, depending on insurance, depending on if they're contracted. So obviously if it's any acute issues, like I had mentioned earlier, worry about that later. You know, your health is most important and, you know, long-term issues is, is probably worse than, you know, having, having some, you know, some lingering bills that you have, but they recommended, you know, if you do have some time, you can look at these websites, you can see the cost, you can contact your insurance, you can look at your panic plan and copay, then you'll have kind of more of a general idea of out-of-pocket cost. Uh, they also said there, there are certainly payment plans uh, that are available so people can pay over time. Uh, you know, we certainly do not want to put anybody uh, in, in the poor house, you know, with medical bills. That is certainly not, not, any, not any hospital's uh, goal. And then they also have some discount programs as well for people where you maybe only have to pay a portion of your bill. And that's depending on, uh, you know, your incomes, a proof of income, that type of stuff. And that all kind of goes through registration and the billing department of the hospital. So long story short, you know, there are obviously costs, you know, related to, to, to seeking medical care. Uh, but, you know, for acute emergency things, you know, that's got to be put in the back of your mind. And then also always know, you know, you can research, you can look into things, and there are options to, to help you with that uh, down the road as well. So I, I thought that was one of the other questions that you asked. Um, was there a third one that you asked or did I kind of cover the two? I, I kind of forgot which ones you'd asked. Just there. about um, recognizing a concussion in someone. We've had some folks that, you know, witnessed, have witnessed crashes and, yeah. um, you know, how can they make sure their friend, yeah. partner, whatever is okay. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, concussion is more of a, a clinical diagnosis. It's more based on a history physical exam rather than necessarily testing. You're not going to find a whole lot of abnormal tests with a, with a standard concussion. So, um, you know, big concerns, things to look for uh, is, is loss of consciousness. So a head injury with loss of consciousness, a sign of a, a significant head injury. So a fall from a height, a fall from a, a high speed, uh, which would certainly go along with biking. Um, I know Steve had mentioned it as well. Amnesia is, is, a, is a very big, important, uh, either antrograde or retrograde amnesia, not remembering the events like 30 minutes prior to the accident, not remembering events after the accident happened. Uh, those are some, you know, high risk. It, maybe it's a concussion, but maybe it could be something more serious. Um, vomiting is, is something very serious as well. So if somebody starts having symptoms of vomiting and the things I'm kind of naming are actually things more where you be worried about a skull fracture or intracranial hemorrhage, which you definitely need to seek medical attention. So what we use to determine if we need to get a head CT is loss of consciousness, amnesia to the event, nausea vomiting episodes, uh, acute confusion, and then also a history of bleeding disorder or history of being on blood thinners. Um, that is huge, uh, particularly even if you're on a baby aspirin, that puts you at a lot increased risk for bleeding. So those are all if you have that, you need to be seen. You need a CAT scan of your head to make sure you don't have anything neurosurgical emergency going on. 
from a concussion standpoint, you know, you could be dizzy, you could have some sound sensitivities, you can have some, you know, light sensitivities, some photophobia, uh, you could just not be quite there, a little slow to answer questions. Um, as it progresses, you can have a, you know, continued headaches, you can have a hard time focusing. The big thing with concussions um, is just giving it time and then preventing a second injury. So there's something out there called second impact syndrome. Uh, which is somebody has a concussion, they have a healing brain, they've not allowed it to heal completely, they get another injury, could still be very mild, and the damaged part of the brain that's re-injured essentially loses its ability to regulate, and it causes a mass inflammation, and it basically could, could lead to death. It's fairly rare. Uh, they say, at least what I looked up, that it's only maybe five to six cases per year documented in the United States. Uh, but about a 50% death rate related to it. And a, a lot of times it's related to athletes, uh, kids, um, you know, adolescents. So obviously there's a lot in the media regarding, but, you know, particularly with biking, you know, the, the big thing is just going through the stepwise pattern of, of returning to activity. You can look it up on any CDC, CDC website. It's a six part series of kind of each day doing, you know, increasing activity levels to the point where you can get back to full activity and then just really avoiding a secondary injury and monitoring for the signs of something more than a concussion, like, like a, a skull fracture or a brain bleed. Those are very, very important. Yeah, if you're able to share that CDC resource, um, you know, to help get back on your bike, that would be helpful as well. Um, Dr. Gullos, I wanted yeah, to try and, yeah, I wanted to ask you about, you all have also had, I think, a couple crash experiences, but when you were 25, uh, you, a car caused your crash, but it did not actually hit you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that and what kind of went into you reporting or not reporting this particular crash? Yeah, um, so th this this one happened, and yes, I've had um, I've had several crashes through the years. So I was trying to remember which one I talked about. So I was uh, biking along um, one of the major roads in um, between Minneapolis and St. Paul here in Minnesota, and um, I was going along, and the bike lane ended. Um, I was going past the university, and it was um, to this part where the bike lane had ended. So I was following a car. Um, you know, I was taking I was taking the lane in the middle of it, and um, I think that car had moved. A bus was in front of me. That bus had moved over, and then I ended up um, as I was getting toward my destination, heading toward the side of the lane. And then there was a whole big pothole in front of me. I had tried to get back over to the lane uh, as I was biking and a car was coming. So I did not. I lost control of my bike and flipped over and I ended up, uh, you know, the, I ended up kind of skidding my wrist a little bit and um, crashing down. I was wearing a helmet and I ended up deciding in this case, I did not seek medical attention. You know, I, I waited for a minute and I I was going to the post office. So I went about my errand and then I, I ended up walking back uh, to my to, where, to the university where I was going so that I didn't end up having to ride a bicycle. And, you know, I, I waited throughout the day to see how I was doing. And thankfully, nothing that I know of happened in that case. Um, and so, you know, I think the calculus for me was just uh, seeing, you know, how I felt, was there a lot of pain, and, you know, what, did I notice anything that, that seemed like there was a serious injury? And so, you know, but in that case, I still ended up walking because I, I was, frankly, just shell-shocked from the experience of being in, like, 8.30 a.m. traffic, uh, thinking I'm just going about my business, and then, boop, off I go. You know, and I, I think coming back to one of the first questions in terms of like, what would you, what would you recommend? I think for me, you know, just expecting the unexpected, you know, any time that I've had a crash on my bike or a potential crash, it's not been something that I would have ever thought, you know, before I went on a ride. And it, it's rare, you know, I bike most days of the year for a lot of my life and would have maybe one or two a year um, that were minor. So I think that would come to it. Just a point on the, the potholes in Ohio, there's a very good case, a friend of mine handled out of Columbus, uh, where a similar crash 
that was caused when a cyclist tried to avoid a pothole, got hit by a car, uh, and ended up as a quadriplegic. And he sued the, the motorist, but he also sued the city of Columbus because the pothole was a, a known pothole. It was in an area that was known after a heavy rain, debris would wash in, there'd be stuff all over the road, which was there that day as well. So uh, he sued the, the city. That case got tossed out. It went up to the Court of Appeals, and the Court of Appeals said, well, no, the city has the same duty to a bicyclist as it would to a motorist once they're aware of a, of a pothole or a, or a uh, nuisance issue on the road where they have to do something about it. And here it was well known to the city that this pothole was there. So they had to pay a million and a half dollars to the victims uh, because of that crash. And so there's a, a good precedent in Ohio for holding the, the, the city to the same standard for a bicyclist to some degree as they would for a car. I mean, a pothole is a, a hazard to either, but that sort of thing really presents a, a major problem for the bike rider trying to stay in the lane. Absolutely, and I'm glad you said that. You know, I think one thing that I would add too is just to, I think you made the point earlier about kind of the shame that cyclists feel whenever we do get into an injury. And absolutely, that was part of my calculus too, was to, you know, do I really need help? Do I really need to do this? And it's, it's hard, you know, every time, you know, I was in a motorcycle crash and that one was serious enough that I, I had to, um, and, you know, the last serious crash I had, I was in Columbus and I'd actually just heard Catherine's story, uh, maybe like a week or two before. And then I ended up in a crash uh, where I was behind a car that suddenly stopped because a car in front of it suddenly stopped because a kid unexpectedly crossed the street. And I couldn't slow down in time. And I ended up rear-ending a car and uh, they, they weren't predictable. And, and I, um, I ended up having a concussion. And so I decided to go to the urgent care clinic I wasn't even sure if there was anything wrong. I didn't want to seek help, but, but I thought about it and decided to go to urgent care. They said, you have a concussion. We need you to go to the ER. I lived like walking distance from Grant Hospital in Columbus. So I was not going to pay for an ambulance to go down the street like a quarter of a mile. So I, I went there and it turned out that, you know, there were no serious brain injuries that were lasting, but I had a couple things with my knee uh, that had come as a result of it after the adrenaline had worn off. And so just kind of to that point, uh, it is important to uh, seek help. Yeah, and time. not just for um, your the physical issues, right? But let's talk a little bit about your, your headspace and getting back on your bike. What advice would you have for folks that may have experienced a crash and are having a hard time um, getting back on their bike? or ways that family members could, or like other folks, like maybe you know someone that's been in a crash that you need to support, um, you guys could speak to that. What helped me, um, what has helped me, has been to really um, just accept wherever I am with it. You know, there have been times where mm -hmm. I have been willing to just get up and get back on it. And there have been times where I decided that biking was out of the question for a little while. And, you know, I challenged myself a little bit at a time to go a little bit further, maybe to go on routes that I knew were safe, maybe to go on a route that was not um, heavily trafficked, maybe to ride not at rush hour and, you know, taking that little bit of those baby steps to get back to where I was so that I could feel comfortable again and trying to learn from that experience of what kind of thing could I be a little more cautious of if there was anything that I could be more cautious of? I think what I would advise or what's helped other people has been just to respect someone's boundary. You know, if I want to go for a ride with someone, my usual riding buddy, and they were just in a crash and they say no, you know, to, to listen to that and maybe go where they might be comfortable or to go where they are, that would be my answer to the question. The uh, people, people cyclists again they tend to have this personality of not showing pain and and being real tough and yeah we ride through anything uh and they're almost afraid to admit that you know that here in a car now takes the hair on the back of their neck stand up and they have some psychological uh response which is a physical response to uh the thought of riding or to hearing things or 
being in an environment that's that's all of a sudden uncomfortable after being comfortable, uh, your health insurance covers that kind of stuff and covers uh, therapy for those kinds of things. And it, it's almost a shameful thing for people to think about doing that. But I encourage people to do that all the time. And we I had a, a fellow, a tough guy in, in a case who got hit by a car in a very weird truck in a very weird accident because the truck was completely in an area where he shouldn't have been and he was trying to cut a corner uh, and ended up hitting this guy and he had the hardest time getting back and you know, we encouraged him to to get some some psychological therapy and it was it was very helpful for him and so I you know it's that may be what you need you may, you may or may not need that but don't rule it out because it's you're going to therapy or something it's it can be very helpful just like physical therapy can help you get over the, the physical limitations. I know for me, if I um, didn't have friends that I could process this stuff with, that it would have been really hard for me to get back on my bike. Um, I, I was very deliberate about being honest about what happened, um, you know, telling the story and telling the story to people who were not going to um, not only not overtly victim blame, but do the kind of victim blaming that was in a desire to keep me safe, to encourage me not to move through the world in the way that I needed to move through the world, um, but who were able to hold space for me and say, you know, while I took the time I needed to process, which would often looked like crying, um, to just be with me and, and recognize like, that sounds terrifying, you know, to just be with me like that was that was a really important part of me being able to get back on a bike. Um, and I think also as, as Dylan talks about the idea of respecting boundaries, for me it was very important to get back on my bike on the corridor where the crash happened. Um, I still feel the hairs on the back of my neck come up as I, when I travel that corridor, as I come up to the intersection where that crash happened, but I've been very deliberate about, um, I was very deliberate about riding because that's what I needed to do as part of my processing. And the people who were most helpful were the people who didn't try to prevent me from um, sorting it out in the way that it made the most sense for me to sort it out. Yeah. All right. Um, I did want to make sure. Go ahead. But I do, and and I think while these conversations about what it might be like for you know any of us as individuals or the individuals that we care about um, when when we talk about crashes, um, I don't want any of us to lose sight of um, the bigger picture, which is. Um, you know, the work that Laura is doing and Bike Miami Valley is doing, which is what do we need to do to make sure that that our, that we don't have to have these conversations, that we actually have streets that are well designed um, for people to travel safely from one place to another. Yeah, absolutely. And um, we're gonna get to talking about an initiative we'd like to start related to that. But Ken, I wanted to, I know you've been monitoring the chat. Uh, was there anything in there we should bring up for, for the group? I wanted to make sure we got to people's questions. Yeah, there were several questions here that are pretty good. I'd like to hear what the panelists had, panelists had to say. Um, Matt asked, how important is ER staff for a cyclist to have a road ID or some kind of medical note in the helmet or a bracelet of some kind. Is this actually helpful for the medical staff? I guess that's also true. You can set up a medical ID on, on your iPhone. And uh, I'd just like to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, yeah, I, will, I can answer that. that. That's very, very important, uh, particularly if for whatever reason, uh, patients incapacitated, unable to relay information. Um, it's very important to be able to get the, the patient's name so we can review past medical history, can review any you know, medical issues or problems they may have. And then also, you know, if they do have some of those bracelets uh, with some past medical history, um, 
it's not uncommon that we'll get a bicycle accident or car accident that comes in that looks like a car accident, but maybe it was, you know, a low blood sugar that caused it or a heart attack that caused it or a seizure that caused it, uh, where really the accident was more of the secondary issue and there's a medical issue that's the primary issue that's, that's the biggest concern of why they're there. So having that information is very important. Our, our medics look for it. Uh, they are trained to look for that, to find it, to relay that information to the medical staff. And uh, the more information we have, particularly if the patient's unable to share it with us, is, is invaluable. So it's, it's very, very helpful to, to have that information. I, I definitely would, uh, if, you, if you have a past medical history, uh, try to keep some sort of medical records on you, particularly if you're, you're doing a, a, a long ride or you know, potentially risky ride. I guess any of them could be, but that's good information to have. So, uh, and the setting up the medical record in your, in your iPhone, for example, is that something that, that ER folks or you know, EMTs know how to read? I, I mean, I'm not really sure particularly with the iPhone because I, I know a lot of them have locks. Uh, so, so long as we can get in the, the phone, then that's not an issue. But if for whatever reason we could get in the phone, then that's maybe something that would be difficult. But uh, if, if they have that information there, if, if there's a way for us to access it or they can show us how to access it, I, that's very, very helpful. But a lot of times, even just having their name, if it's somebody that's local, um, we'll have their medical records. And our medical records now can combine with the whole country, uh, essentially. So we can get medical records from pretty much anywhere uh, electronically, uh, which is helpful. So if we pretty much have your name and demographic information, we can get most of that. But regarding the cell phone, that's kind of something new uh, that, that I've not seen a lot of, uh, but I, I definitely don't think it would hurt if, if we're able to get that information. Okay, thanks. Uh, another question that's pretty good, I think, is uh, Anne asked, have some studies shown that drivers of vehicles are less careful around bike riders who are well outfitted with cycling gear? So if you're wearing the spandex, are you more, are you more susceptible? Um, there's not a lot of research, but the research that exists says yes, that is true that um, the conditions under which motorists tend to have greatest respect for a rider um, is somebody dressed in quote unquote normal clothes, um, clothes that, rec that um, might remind them of someone they know. Um, uh, when measuring close passes, the research that I've seen, and again, this is there's plenty of room in the field to, to dig deeper in here, um, is that a regular type wardrobe gets fewer close passes than not only somebody dressed in a cycling kit, but even somebody who's dressed in um, a uniform that looks like law enforcement. Um, uh, I almost always ride in a dress and in the summertime in heels, uh, in the wintertime often boots with heels, in large part because I think I'm treated differently um, uh. when I am dressed that way than when I am dressed in a kit. Um, since I've started recreationally cycling and I am on a longer ride and am in a kit, um, I have found the comfort of a kit and I understand why people wear them now. Um, but if I'm on a road with cars, I've got bike shorts on under my dress. Um, yeah, if, if I know I'm going to be interfacing with a lot of drivers, I'm dressed like, a, I'm dressed like the 55 year old lady that I am, you know, mom, grandma, um, that hopefully somebody can identify with. Steve, do you have something to say about that? I was going to just echo what Catherine said. I've read the same type of thing. We seem to be seeing an uptick in just aggressive driving. And, and I see, I, I anecdotally am getting more reports from people who are getting yelled at and buzzed and cut off. And there seems to be kind of an uptick in confrontations. Uh, but to me, it's always been sort of two types of motorists that I worry about. One is the is the aggressive intentional driver and the other is the, oh gee, I didn't know the bike was even around driver who's just kind of wandering through life uh, carelessly. So 
uh, there seems to be an uptick in that. I don't know if that relates to, I don't know if people like, I, I don't know if they do that to the Amish people in the buggies too, or is it just the kitted up, uh, you know, riders on the weekend? Uh, you know, it seems, the research seems to say that if you're dressed more like a normal person, you get a wider berth and the cars give you a little more room when they pass you. Along those same lines, um, I always hold a lane position that requires somebody to think when they're passing me. Um, I never position myself in somebody's peripheral vision or in a position where I'm cueing them that there might be enough space for you little fiat to fit between me and the line. Like I want to position myself that in a way where you have to think when you're passing me. Um, whether that's you need to change into a lane that's traveling the same direction, or you need to wait until it's safe to cross that double yellow line to pass me. Um, as uh, I've, I got married about seven years ago and now have a car in my household. Um, and as I've driven, one of the things that I've realized is um, I, I don't think drivers pass us close because they're jerks. I think drivers pass us close because we are so trained as motorists to stay in the lines that if we can pass someone while staying in the lines, that's what we do. But if we have to think before we pass them, if we have to get outside of what's the rote behavior, then people think when they pass us. And I want somebody to be engaged in the process of thinking when they pass me. I wrote a piece 30 years ago, I called it the Magus phenomenon, because I noticed that if once they, I, I was like a plane of glass was there. And once they broke that plane of glass at the lane line, then they would they would go around me and give me enough room. If they thought they could get between my elbow and that plane of glass without breaking it, they did it almost every time. So you learn to venture out into a, a lane space that, that, that A, makes you more conspicuous to traffic. You're in their, their, their vision and you're in their brain earlier in the game than if you're riding off to the right. And so that gives people more time to evaluate, oh, I see that person there 200 yards up, but if you're riding in the shoulder or you're on the white line, you don't always come into the train until the last minute. And I'd much rather have somebody mad at me because I'm slowing them down than somebody saying, oh, where did he come from? You know, that's, you wanna be uh, perceived as early as possible in, in the, the traffic situation. So, yeah, so. Yeah. We are, uh, yeah, we are coming up on our hour. So I did want to give a little bit of time to each panelist for closing comments. And then we'll, we'll stop the recording, make a couple announcements. If anybody wants to, I'm not going to like end this meeting. So if anybody wants to stay on the call and, and chat, you're more than welcome to. Uh, but right now, let's let's jump to closing comments. And Mr. Magus, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Um, the big sentence here is not, oh my God, crashes are everywhere. The big sentence is cycling is safe. It's safe in Ohio. When you look at the stats, and I'd look at the stats in Ohio and all around the country, and Ohio is a safe state to ride. Uh, we have relatively few crashes given the 11 and a half million people that live here and the millions of people that ride bikes here. So uh, cycling is basically safe in Ohio and it's safer than it is in, in many other places. So if we leave this what to do if you crash seminar with a thought uh, that cycling is safe, then I think we're getting both messages across here. Thank you. Dr. Morrow. Uh, yeah, I just want to thank you guys very much for having me. I actually uh, learned a lot. So uh, I, I really greatly appreciate that. Uh, one of the big things, uh, wear a helmet. I've seen helmet really, really, really save people. Uh, so please, please, please always wear the helmet. I'm sure everybody on here does, but try to get that message out because it, it definitely saves lives and, and definitely decreases overall morbidity. And also, you know, try to try to be in tandem or try to have some way to communicate, whether it's a cell phone or some sort of medical alert device, uh, if you are by yourself, uh, just so you can get the help you need, uh, you know, if, if, that, if that arises. But yeah, thank you guys very much. I, I really appreciate everybody's time. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Gullis, would you like to go next? Sure. 
Um, you know, I, I'm going to probably echo what, what's already been said. You know, I think it's really important for us to do the things that we can to minimize our own risk, right? Like wearing a helmet, being thoughtful and rather limp position, wearing visible clothing, um, because we are cyclists in a, in a, on roads where we have less space and less power than motorists. And, you know, with that being said, what we know from a lot of transportation research on autos is that people's attention behind the wheel is just getting worse and worse and worse. And uh, attempts to change things with cell phones are kind of like, eh. So, you know, with that being said, you know, we have a, we have a, we need to take care of our own um, health and protect ourselves as best we can as cyclists to minimize the risk of injury while also recognizing that what we need are better roads and what we need are fewer cars uh, because it is not cyclists to, that are responsible for our crashes, you know, and to echo Steve as well, cycling is safe. You know, driving a car has risks, staying home has risks, everything has a baseline level of risk. So I don't want to lose sight of that. But cycling itself is a very safe activity to do, and there's a lot of joy in it. And I want to end on that note. Thank you. Well, and I guess I'd like to say that um, uh, thinking as, as we see, um, as, as we're thinking about crashes, um, these increasing crashes are not just with cyclists and pedestrians, they're motorist to motorist. Like they're, um, comparatively speaking, cycling is safe and we as a community get to have much higher expectations about safe streets for everyone. Um, we actually know in, as transportation professionals, um, there's pretty clear data in the engineering field and in the planning field about how to create safe streets. Um, and the only reason we're not doing it is because um, we have elected officials who are worried about public pushback of what, what a redesign of a road might be for seconds or minutes in delaying a car from getting from A to B. Um, as a community, we need to speak more fervently about how much we care about the health and safety and the lives of all travelers um, and that we care about it over the speed, um, the minutes and seconds that get saved in road design that helps lead to these kind of crashes. We're in a culture where a $50,000 pickup truck is a necessity, but a $2,500 bike is frivolous. I mean, you know, it's, it's this assessment of costs and how we're spending money that is skewed in the motoring favor. Right? So to, to echo some of what Catherine said, I, you know, we can uh, participate in this process by helping uh, sort of revise uh, the goals that government has and where we're spending money and why. And, and putting the people first and, and trying to do things to protect the most vulnerable people out there. So I think that's a great message for us to end on. Thank you to all of our panelists for participating.